dear urologists uh, watching the program all over the world uh, as you all know the pure urology is doing surgical technique based presentations every other day or alternate day by the eminent faculty across the world today the topic is uh, uh, enucleation of the prostate with thulium fiber laser as you all know uh, last uh, two decades uh, the enucleation is there was there and will be going to be th is going to be there large glands it is more useful traditionally it is done with the uh, homium 100 watts laser now 120 watts laser is also present and now the thulium fiber laser last few years we are listening some bipolar enucleation is also uh, is bipolar enucleation is also there but the important point is how much you are using the mechanical force to rotate the sheath to enucleate the tumor versus precisely cutting the uh, capsule, imagining the plane and then keep on going. Naturally, if you use the manual force, there is chance of a stretch on the sensitive sphincter, whatever may be the size of the sheath is bigger. So these controversies kept the TURP as the gold standard still. But things are science keep on changing technology may change in the future to a smaller uh, resectoscope and smaller uh, uh, enucleation sheath also in that case the lasers play a major role and previously discussed incontinence is a controversial issue to know all this today we have an esteemed speaker uh, dr neem bojani from montreal uh, good, good evening sir for us it is good evening i think it's uh, good morning uh, there thank you for accepting the invitation first of all and you have an excellent academic career. I want to know about your career a little bit. Uh, when did you develop interest in surgery? In your sure. career? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank you for the invitation to present. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here. Um, so I'm born and raised in Montreal. I did all my training in Montreal until I went to Indianapolis to do my fellowship. Um, I've always wanted to be a uh, that's not true, actually. I wanted to be a scientist first, and uh, I actually did uh, two bachelors. I did physiotherapy. I actually worked as a physiotherapist, uh, and then I said I wanted to go to medical school. So then I went to medical school. I didn't want to be a surgeon. I uh, wanted to be a lung specialist, and then um, when I uh, started doing my surgery rotations, that's when I started falling in love with surgery. Uh, and then we, for us, we do two, two weeks of urology, and that's where I started to say that that's for me. And uh, the rest is history, as they say. So, yeah, it's been... Who, who, a, it's was, been your, who was your mentor in uh, urology? Uh, so many, so many mentors. There's so many wonderful people in urology. Uh, so at, at the institution where I am, there's a, a well-known prostate cancer uh, surgeon by the name of Fred Saad, uh, world-renowned. So he's my mentor, my chairman. Uh, ben Chu, Dr. Ben Chu from Vancouver is a very good friend of mine and a, a very good mentor. Dr. Denstead, uh, whom you all know, uh, has yeah, yeah. really guided me. Uh, there's so many wonderful people in urology that have really helped me get to where I am now. So, so many How many urologists will be there in uh, Canada? Um, Canada has a, a lot. Uh, we're over 600. Um, at my institution, we have the largest number of urologists in one institution. There's 15 of us. In, but there's quite a bit. And uh, uh, do you think that the urology is no more uh, super speciality and it is subdivided into a lot, lot of super specialities like stone, prostate, yes. cancer, urology? Do you agree that in future it will be uh, it will be uh, already, already. I think in Western countries, yes. focus is on the specific subject. Uh, absolutely. So, when I started my practice with eight years ago, uh, I used to do a little bit of everything. Now I do per percutaneous nephrolithotomy, ureteroscopy, and enucleation. That's about it. We might be doing some aqua ablation soon, but that's it. I, I don't do very much else. Uh, I'm very, very focused practice. Very. Yeah, results will be better and uh, people like yes. you become, uh, become the pioneers and then write papers and then give a path to the youngsters. So dear uh, friends, uh, the talk on pure urology focused on surgical techniques is TFL enucleation of the prostate by Dr. Neem Bojani. Uh, he has the rank of associate professor and clinical researcher at the University of Montreal. 
he obtained a bsc in microbiology and immunology another in physiotherapy as he said from the mcgill university in 2001 and then completed medical school and urology residency at the university of montreal in 2011 dr bajani spent two years with uh, ling at in indiana university completing his fellowship in bph and stone disease uh, dr bajani was recruited by the university of montreal in 2013 to build and develop comprehensive kidney stone and bph programs in 2017 dr bajani has named the aus young urologists of the year representing the nsaua uh, in 2019 he was awarded the prestigious clinical research scholar award from the frqs I really appreciate the interest in research starting from the physiotherapy that shows you are uh, uh, you are and you wanted to go into the clinical research as priority and we have already seen some of the papers today along with me Dr Manas is there to moderate and uh, ask the question because he is focused and interested in our unit uh, uh, the enucleation of the prostate more so with thulium fiber laser with this introduction I once again thank uh, Professor Neem Bujani and hand over the program to you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you so much for the uh, the kind uh, introduction and the, the invitation to present uh, this morning. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, so I was asked to talk about thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate. Uh, I do have disclosures. I'm a consultant for Olympus, Boston Scientific, and Procept Biorobotics. Uh, so really quickly, we'll just talk about the uh, technology. And one thing I'd like to mention, uh, it's, uh, you, you know, please stop me at any time. If there's any questions, uh, yeah. it's my, my pleasure to, to answer them. So just really quickly, uh, for those who don't know, uh, and, and uh, you know, I learned from Dr. Mohan that you've had this technology for quite a long time now, which is very interesting. Uh, but it's really important to understand that thulium fiber laser is not the same thing as a thulium YAG laser. Thulium YAG laser has been developed in the early 2000s. It's a laser used only for BPH, and it's a very different laser than the thulium fiber laser. It's actually more similar to the homium YAG laser. So thulium fiber laser, as you know, has this long laser uh, fiber within the machine, which is dotted with these thulium ions. These thulium ions are activated with diode lasers. Uh, once those uh, thulium ions are activated, they're then placed into a surgical fiber. So I think what's really important uh, when we talk about a nucleation, the gold standard has always been the homium YAG laser. Uh, now we have the thulium fiber laser. So I think it's important to understand the differences. My, my, most of my career was with the homium YAG laser. So uh, it's really important to understand these are not the same lasers. So the homium YAG laser uh, you have already used in the past uses flash lamps to activate uh, protons, which will activate homium, uh, which will activate homium ions on a crystal, which will then be placed into a surgical fiber. Homium YAG laser, uh, because it uses flash lamps, requires uh, a cooling system. Uh, that's why the machine is so big, and that's why it makes so much noise. Compared to the thulium fiber laser, uh, very, very different lasers. More specifically, if you look at the energy, so the max energy is about the same, so six joules for both. However, the lower end of the energy is much lower with the thulium fiber lasers. You can go down to 0 0.01, 0 0.02, which you can't do with the homium YAG laser. And this is important when you do uh, lithotripsy. Uh, frequency, you all know, homium YAG can only go to about 80 hertz, whereas the thulium fiber laser can go up to 1,000, 2,000 hertz. Pulse width, the pulse width of the thulium fiber laser can go extremely longer than the homium YAG laser. Very important uh, uh, for hemostasis, uh, for stone disease, uh, for decreasing that retropulsion. Um, of course, the plug, uh, the homium YAG laser, you need a special plug, which you don't need with the thulium fiber laser. And then really another very important point is the depth of penetration. If you look at the homium YAG laser, if you touch the tissue, 100% of the energy with the homium YAG laser is transferred to tissue. With the thulium fiber laser, same thing. When you get to 0.3 millimeters away from the tissue, there's only about a third of the energy of the homium YAG laser that's transmitted to tissue versus basically none with the thulium fiber laser. So the thulium fiber laser is actually more shallower, has a shallower depth of penetration than the homium YAG laser. And then finally, and probably most importantly, uh, is the uh, light absorption. So if you look at where they are on the uh, light spectrum, the homium YAG laser almost looks 
identical to the thulein fiber laser at 2100 hertz versus uh, nanomicrons versus 1940. However, when you look at their absorption in water, this is where there's a big difference. So the thulein fiber laser is actually four times more absorbed in water than the homium YAG laser. So this is important for both lithotripsy and for uh, enucleation. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. So enucleation. So this is uh, basically, in my opinion, the gold standard for the treatment of BPH. Uh, there's many, many, many treatments out there. Uh, but if you look at the literature, if you look at um, all the different advantages of BPH surgery, enucleation checks most of the boxes. Uh, there's probably maybe the one thing that it doesn't check is uh, ejaculation. You, you don't have ejaculation afterwards, but other than that, it's pretty much amazing. So uh, in the 90s, Dr. Gilling developed the technique. Ever since then, we have tremendous amount of uh, level one evidence. Uh, we know it's very durable, you know, over 18 years uh, of experience we have with this uh, procedure with a very low re-intervention rate. It's about one in a thousand. I've been doing this for eight years and I haven't re-operated on a patient. So, uh, you know, this is a surgery that once it's done, you don't have to do anything else. Very nice. You also get uh, tissue for pathological evaluation. Uh, I've been doing this for eight years. We've done a number of studies and the uh, positivity rate is between eight and 10%. You know, this is very interesting. Even in the era of MRI and biopsy, I, you know, I work up all my patients. You know, if a patient comes with a 150 gram prostate and he has a PSA of 20, you say, oh, it's maybe just the prostate. But, you know, I always work them up, MRI, biopsy. Even still, the positivity rate is between 8 and 10%. Now, mind you, it's low-grade cancer. These are older men. But still, I found, uh, you know, Gleason 8s, Gleason 7s, Gleason, Gleason 9s. Um, some of these have gone on to radiation therapy. So this is a nice feature of enucleation. Safety, it's an extremely, extremely safe procedure. Um, oh, this one. And then cost effective. As you know, as I've heard, it's very cheap, the thulean fiber laser, uh, the laser fiber, the scope, the morselator, morselator blades, everything is reusable. Uh, you can do it in the anticoagulated patient, as you know, and you can do any prostate size. This is not for under 80 or above 80 or this is basically every prostate. Gold standard, as, we, uh, as I mentioned, is still the homium YAG laser. Uh, but since then, as mentioned, you know, many, many different uh, lasers have been, uh, have been uh, tried, have been published on. Uh, you can see them here. I've tried a number of these that I'll talk, to, I'll talk about in a sec. There are some drawbacks, right? Uh, we all know that there's two main drawbacks of enucleation. Uh, the first is the length of the procedure, and the second is learning curve. Length of the procedure uh, has always been talked about as it's too long, especially here in North America. Uh, we don't get paid extra uh, because the procedure is long. So people always complain about the length of the procedure. But the truth is, if you look at the amount of tissue that's removed, uh, it's actually the same as TERP. It's just that we take out much more tissue with, uh, with the nucleation than we do with TERP. And that's why it takes a little longer. Uh, and you can see this with the drop in the PSA, right? Uh, the PSA after a hole up is 70, 80% decreased versus TERP, maybe 30, 40%. And the other one is learning curve. I think this is an important thing to discuss. Um, if you look at the literature, it's anywhere between 20 and you know, 50 cases. Um, you know, I've, I've been working with a lot of urologists, as mentioned, Dr. Mohan, there's a lot of interest in enucleation, right? So. Um, which is very exciting, which is great. Um, but we need to figure out how to teach people this procedure. I think this is really, really important. Um, so just Monday, I had uh, two urologists come from the United States to watch and observe, um, you know, uh, enucleation with the thulean fiber laser. Um, you know, I think there's a number of things we can discuss. I think, you know, uh, you have to be motivated, obviously. I think you have to watch lots of videos, you know, you know come and see somebody do the procedure. But I really think the ideal situation is an expert goes to your facility uh, and helps you do a few cases before you start doing it yourself. I think it's, um, uh, it can be done. Uh, you know, a number of urologists have you know, been self-taught, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve. 
So my personal experience, uh, before I went to thulium fiber laser, I had done the homium YAG laser. That's what I was trained on. Dr. Lingaman taught me uh, to do HOLEP. Uh, I did do some green light laser enucleation of the prostate um, about two years ago. Uh, the thing with HOLEP, uh, for those who have done HOLEP, is it's a very good procedure. Uh, however, it does bleed a little bit. Um, it's not something that causes transfusions, but it does cause a little bit of bleeding. And so that's why I went to green light because of the hemostatic properties. Uh, but the problem with green light is it's a side fire laser. And that makes it, uh, as mentioned, you have to do a lot of manual torquing, which I didn't like. And so uh, now my thulium fiber laser is close to a hundred cases. Um, I think it's important to understand that if you're switching over from another laser to the thulium fiber laser, there is a learning curve, even if you've done a thousand holeps. Uh, so early experience is about 10 to 15 cases. Uh, now I'm much faster. Uh, I have better hemostasis. About 80% of my patients go home the same day of the procedure. So on Monday, I did um, a 200 gram prostate with four centimeters of, uh, of bladder stone. I did 125 gram prostate and I did a 60 gram prostate. All of them went home the same day of the procedure. We, we can talk about that uh, if that's interesting. So this is the machine here in Canada or in North America, actually. So it's from Olympus. It's the uh, thulium fiber laser. It's a very small machine. So very similar to the one you have here, I'm sure. The nice thing is it's, you know, uh, you, you basically can load laser fiber yourself. You have this nice flat screen panel. So you can basically set up your parameters and uh, very easy to use. So what do I use? So um, I've tried a lot of different parameters. So first of all, I use a 550 micron laser fiber. The nice thing about this is that you can do bladder stones as well, which we'll talk about. In terms of settings, so I've tried a lot of different settings. It would be great to discuss uh, later on. But uh, basically what I use is one joule and 60 hertz for enucleation with the short pulse and one joule and 30 hertz with the long pulse for hemostasis. Um, I have tried, and I don't usually, sometimes I do, if, I'm, if I have a resident with me, I'll, I'll lower the energy to 0.5 joules and 60 hertz. Um, if you've tried this, it's a, it's a nice setting, it's less energy, but uh, it doesn't cut as well, I find. And so uh, I have a tendency to use mostly one joule 60 hertz. Um, and then if you're starting off, uh, you know, if I have a resident with me, I'll, I'll either lower the energy. I'll also use the aiming beam, which uh, usually I don't use. Um, but uh, those are the settings that I personally use and I think are, are best at this time. So what are the steps of enucleation? So just in general, when you're doing a, nu a nucleation, the first step is to find the plane of enucleation. This is the most crucial step in the procedure. And of course, apical dissection, right? So this, this first step is basically the key to enucleation. If you can find the plane of enucleation, if you can do the apical dissection, the rest is very easy. Uh, bladder entry. So when I get over the top, so I've done my apical enucleation, I get over to the top, I then head towards the bladder. I then go into the bladder. Uh, if you're gonna do a two lobe technique, you're then gonna split the anterior commissure. And then you have to do a five o'clock groove, a seven o'clock groove, or a six o'clock groove. It's only two lobes. Nobody does three lobes anymore. Now, if you're starting off in enucleation, uh, three lobe is not a bad idea. You can start by enucleating out that median lobe. It gives you some nice practice. I usually recommend if you're starting off on enucleation to just do a median lobe. So find a patient with a big median lobe and just do that. You do a five o'clock groove, a seven o'clock groove, and then you enucleate out the median lobe. This will give you practice in using the laser, in enucleation, uh, in uh, hemostasis, in morselation. It's really the best way, in my opinion, to start with enucleation. And we'll talk about that at the end of the pr uh, presentation. And then after that, once you've split the prostate in two, the rest is very easy. Uh, it's lateral and posterior lobe enucleation, pushing it into the bladder. Um, there's a lot of discussion. We'll talk about it. Uh, end block versus two lobe. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, near the end of the presentation. So we're going to get into the videos now. Um, again, probably the, the most important and crucial step is the first step is finding the plane of enucleation. If you find the plane and you stick on the plane, it's easy. Another key 
key um, step or a key ingredient when you're doing a nucleation, in my opinion, is being able to recognize tissue. If you recognize what the capsule looks like, if you know what um, uh, the um, prostate tissue looks like, then you'll be able to know the difference. But more importantly, you will stay on the capsule. And if you get into trouble, let's say you start cutting into the prostate, you'll know it because you say, oh no, the, the capsule is not here. So uh, try to recognize planes. I think that's really, really important. Uh, once you start recognizing planes, then it gets easier. You know you're in the right plane, the wrong plane. You know how to get back to the right plane. So I think that's really, really important. So first video again is finding the plane of a nucleation. So this is a a hundred gram prostate. So there's the Vera Montanum. Here's the sphincter. I like to start about a centimeter proximal to the Vera Montanum. I think that's one of the easiest places to find the plane of a nucleation. Uh, there's many ways to find the plane of a nucleation. So that's where I start. I try to line this up with where the prostate hits the floor of the capsule. Okay, so right where that lateral lobe hits the floor that's the other space where you can find the capsule right there and i'll show you that in a sec here um but so the first place is here i already see the capsule so the capsule is right there okay we see it already now if you can find it there the other spot is where the lateral lobe hits the floor so i'll show you that here now so you go to the side right there right where that crease is that's where the plane of a nucleation will be so if you can't find it proximal to the vero you go to the lateral side. You can go to the right side or the left side. It's very important. If you do the right side, let's say, and it doesn't go well, you can't find the capsule, no problem. Go to the other side. And then you can come do it uh, at the end of the case. But uh, you have many options to be able to find the plane of nucleation. And another option is you could even go at 12 o'clock, but that's more of an advanced technique. I wouldn't recommend it. So once you found the capsule here, very really important, look at the capsule. It's glossy kind of shiny. You just want to split the tissue. Basically, you want to separate the prostate from the capsule. Um, I think this is most important. Yeah. Uh, right there. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm really impressed uh, that the, the darkening of the tissue by the thulium fiber laser is not noticed. What is the secret? You are moving the laser fiber very quick in the plane. Yeah, so that's a very good point. So um, what you'll notice and what I always tell people is stay away from the tissue. If you notice, my laser fiber doesn't touch the tissue. Yeah. I'm about half a centimeter away, roughly. Yeah. Uh, and I'll show you another video. But the more you touch the tissue, the more you get that carbonization. Yeah. So I like to stay away from the tissue. You get rid of that carbonization and also... Uh, I find it splits the tissue better than when you touch the tissue. And, and I'll show you another video. Yeah, yeah. This we were not doing. Yeah, you, yeah. You, Me too. It becomes immediately dark and we feel little unhappy when compared to homium. It yeah, is yeah, I agree. It's almost like homium in this video. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, that, that's what many people say is that, uh, see, I'm again, I'm not touching the tissue. Sometimes yeah. you have no choice, right? Sometimes when there's no space, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you have to touch the tissue. But I almost always stay away from the tissue. And I'll show you what happens when you touch the tissue. Yes. Beautiful. So you so you found the plane now. Now the other, the next step, again, crucial step, is the apical dissection, okay? The sphincter is right behind you. Uh, you don't want to cut the sphincter. Uh, you don't have as much room. So this is important. So this is the same case I'm just going up the side now. So very nicely, you can see, again, you see how far I am from the tissue? So yeah. I lift the tissue up ever so softly. And then I just go up slowly. Uh, so there's not a lot of room here. I've already done the sphincter separation, which I'll show you at the end of the procedure. Uh, again, you're just basically lifting the prostate tissue and cutting the attachments between the prostate and the capsule. This step and the previous step are slower. This is normal. These steps should take longer. Uh, it, you, these are the crucial steps in the procedure. If you do these steps well, the rest will be much faster. Uh, you'll be able to do them faster, but these steps are slower. 
So just very nicely here again, try to appreciate the capsule versus the right. tissue. Very, very important. You, I know where I'm going. I know where the capsule is. I know where I'm going to go with the, you know, so if you can do that, the rest of the procedure is very easy. Very important. If you haven't done homium laser, you won't appreciate this, but there's very little bleeding with this laser. Okay, granted, this prostate was exceptional, but but um, there's a lot less bleeding with this laser compared to the homium YAG laser. So I know you guys have been doing uh, thulium fiber laser for a while now, but the yeah. homium YAG laser, it bleeds more. It, it just does. So, so here we're up at uh, almost 12 o'clock. Uh, ideally, you want to get over the top and then I go towards the bladder. And I'll show you that in the next video. So Dr. Mohan. You, you are not using mechanical at all. You are rotating only. Trying. I'm trying to use less mechanical. Correct. Less mechanical. You're not pushing yeah. much. With That's sport. right. Yeah. I try not to. I try not to. That is correct. Yes. yes now, yes. That, being, that being said, to your point, um, if you've separated the sphincter from the adenoma, you could push if you want, right? At that point, the sphincter is no longer attached to the adenoma. You can basically push if you want. And I do push, and I'll show you. Uh, how I do push later on for the lateral enucleation when the prostate is basically detached. Okay. Um, I think, I, I don't know if we want to, dis do you want to discuss incontinence now or later? Yeah, but, uh, whatever, if your time is not the question, this is a permanent document. We, lo we love yeah. to listen as much possible. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just say quickly that everything that's talked about for incontinence, nothing is proven, huh? You know, small sheath, early apical dissection, uh, top down, uh, there's nothing proven. There is no literature to support any of it. Uh, so, so I'm not saying one is better than the other. I do some things that I think are, are important. Um, but until there's data, until there's literature, you know, my, 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 uh, my mentor, he still does the same way. He encircles the... Uh, the uh, mucosal strip at the end, you know, pulling on the sphincter. Is it better? Is it worse? We don't know. This is the good, this is the exciting part of enucleation. We don't know. But, but we'll talk about that later on. I have some videos. Right. So here, right. this is to your point, Dr. Mohan. So when I started, when I started thulium fiber laser, I used to touch the tissue. So look at this terrible video. This is uh, in my early learning curve. So see all the brown tissue everywhere that, you know, I didn't like. And if you look at my laser fiber, you know, there's tissue on the laser fiber. I yes, touched yes. the tissue because it was early on. I didn't know that I didn't, uh, I didn't have to touch the tissue and I was treating it like a homium YAG laser. So this is now later on in my learning curve. I've learned to stay away from the tissue. Look at how much nicer it is, you know. It's uh, the best thing to today. Yeah, Definitely. yeah, so much better, right? Yeah, yeah. Very, very clean. Uh, the tissue separates better, I find. Uh, there's no charring of the tissue. It's so I'm far over... away, half centimeter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually between 0.5 and one centimeter away. Great. So now I'm heading towards the bladder. When you see these up and down fibers, that's the best part. You know that right on the other side of this is the bladder, right? You have the bladder neck on top, and then these are the last attachments to get into the bladder. So um, once, once you've gotten into the bladder, I, I really feel that the procedure is basically over. Uh, the hardest parts are done. You, you, I've already done my sphincter separation. I've done my apical dissection. I'm in the bladder. After this, I give it to the residents. Uh, you know, this is the yeah. best time to learn now is, uh, is, is now. So again, appreciate the tissues. So bladder neck on top, uh, you can easily see, hopefully the bladder neck, see they're very nice planes, um, very easy to, uh, to, to discern. Take the time to look at the tissue. You can, you can decide if you just take the time, especially early on in your learning curve, try to recognize tissues. So there's two ways to do a nucleation, either with laser energy or with manual traction, as you mentioned. Uh, yes. I tend to do more laser energy, as you can see here, uh, but you can do manual traction, as I'll show you here. The only problem with manual traction, other than the sphincter, is bleeding, right? So when you push down on the tissue, you have to go back and do your hemostasis. So here you'll yes. see me push down. 
So you have to go back and do the hemostasis. So I have a tendency to use more laser energy, which allows me to cut the tissue and do the hemostasis at the same time. Um, when I started enucleation, I used to do a lot of manual traction. Uh, now I do a lot more laser energy. I still do manual traction, but uh, I do more uh, laser energy now than, uh, than manual traction. So we'll move on. So we've basically gone over the top into the bladder. So now I'm showing here a two lobe technique. So I think this is the, the groove now. Yeah, so finding the ureteral orifice. So I'm gonna do a five o'clock groove here. Uh, I think you, you mentioned that you were doing N block mostly, right? Yeah. I, do you do, let me ask you a question. This, so this is just a groove, this is easy. Uh, do you, when you do N block, do you do it for all prostates? Do you do it for, let's say, a 200 gram prostate or 250? Muted. Unmute. Sir, un unmute, unmute, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, for the large prostate, median lobe, it is very difficult to do N block. Yeah. You have to apply too much pressure on the other side. Sometimes you feel it's some lot of resistance. And, uh, and that time we will incise at the in size of the trying to do less than 100 grams it is easy yes With large median lobe it is very difficult to push either of the lobes uh, yeah manas you also give a comment on that please because he is also now doing equally in other center of ours Sir, uh, most, most commonly within less than 100 grams the end block is very easier when it really? more than 100 grams sometimes it will become difficult but we can do end block just by giving single incision either at uh, 12 o'clock or 5 o'clock so that gland will be in a single bunch but not like uh, a typical two lobe technique so the, just if you give incision at, at either at 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock we can do the end block but it's not full donut end block it will be end block okay. okay very interesting so yeah i i'll do end block up to about 125 150 i've done as well depends on the imaging too right sometimes it says 150 and it's only you know 70. um I want to ask a question. I want to ask a question here. Yeah, yeah. We find it difficult. Uh, yeah. The the initial part of this uh, sphincter release is very important. Understood. Yes. And once you enter the bladder, you will be a lot of confident. After yes. that, in the mid part of the lateral lobe towards the bladder neck, more more towards the bladder neck, when you are doing it, we are not able to the meet the plane from below above easily in a large gland what is uh what is uh, i mean we are finding little difficult our, our experience is around uh, 100 cases now uh, yeah. still still little difficult in large glands to dissect the lateral lobe exactly in the middle part so are you talking about so you're doing a two lobe technique now uh, two, two lobe technique or the end block recently we have started end block maybe 20 cases okay. Uh, yeah. When we do either way, the lateral part in the middle part where the maximum bulk is there. Uh, yes. More so in N-block, more so in N-block. I think I know you're asking. You're asking once you've decided, if you do uh, whatever you do, uh, N-block yes. or two lobe, yeah. you're saying you've done it and now you're trying to push it into the bladder and yes. this problem is getting all the way underneath or on the side. Is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Underneath and side oh. in the middle part. I'll give you the best trick. I'm not saying it's going to work, but what I what I think is the problem is you always okay. So let's say um, either way, whichever one you're doing, whatever end block or if it's a two lobe, you start at the top. Yes. And you go. You go. Uh, let's say from twelve o'clock down to uh, three o'clock. Okay. Yeah. Or the other side, whichever one you want. But you yes. go until you can't go anymore so all the way all the way around you don't go from from below don't yeah, go from we, below we, we used to do half off a little below a little above like that yeah, yeah. don't do that okay. do only as much as you can you do lateral side as much you go you go to the bladder neck you go as much as you can you do the la all, as much as you can but you stay around the 12 to three o'clock uh -huh. or uh, 12 to uh, 7 o'clock. All along the length. You mean to say all along the length. Length also. Exactly. I mean, exactly. Exactly. I will show you. I will show you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will show you. This is, this is, in my opinion, the key. It doesn't always work. Let's be honest. Sometimes the prostate is too big. 
and yeah. you have to morselate uh, in the fossa or, or we can talk about that as well but the key in my opinion is lateral all the way down you try you're trying to get to six o'clock almost on both sides okay and um it's easier to push the prostate like this or like this than to push it that, like this okay okay that means uh, after releasing the incision at the front of the veru you don't do any more dissection there i don't no directly you go to the anteriorly and then come down every part exactum exactly correct okay yeah. we used to do half of the dissection from below so it used yeah. to create a lot of problem to connect both of them yes yes yeah. okay i okay. do i i'm very aggressive i go as much as i can yeah, yeah. in my mind the best is i've gone almost to six o'clock okay then okay. i know it's gonna go into the prostate then it's easy okay, okay but but i'm not saying it will work all the time right these 200 gram prostates sometimes they just don't want to go in the bladder it's it's okay you can do a have you done prostate you do the morselation in the fossa it's not the end of the world i've done this many times but it won't bleed no, it's almost all detached, right? You only have the posterior attachment, but no, no, I do it. It happens a lot of times. If the prostate is too big, you know, 200, 300 gram prostate, it's hard to get it into the bladder. So yeah. you make sure your hemostasis is good and you can start morselating in the fossa. It's actually much safer, right? There's the fossa, you're yeah. not going to hurt the yeah, fossa. Yeah. So. Uh, does, yeah. it work, does it work with, because water flow will be a little less. Does it yes. work equally faster? I mean, just a doubt. No, it's slower, it's slower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you are correct. Oh, yeah. The flow is the flow is not so good, but uh, uh, as long as you have good uh, good visualization, uh, it's actually not bad. But it it does take a little more time. There's not as much room. It doesn't it doesn't move around. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. If you have to. Right? Yes, yes, understood. Just to finish off the two lobe technique. So yes. here you've gone over the top as we mentioned. Yes. So now we go back in, and basically cut the prostate in two. So that's what we've already done. That's the, the enucleation we've already done. And now we're just splitting the prostate in two. Again, this is just the two lobe technique. We've already split at five o'clock and now we're splitting at noon. If you're doing the end block procedure, as you know, you don't need to do either of these grooves. There's no grooves. Uh, you just basically enucleate and push into the bladder. So this is a fa fairly easy here. Um, one of the things with end block, I think, uh, which is limiting, which you probably do the same, is I try to keep the bladder neck intact. I don't like to cut the bladder neck if I can help it. It's not a big deal, but I think that also limits what you can push into the bladder. Uh, people who uh, say that they do end block for 200 gram prostate, for example, uh, you have the, they are cutting the bladder neck. You can't push a 200 gram prostate into a bladder uh, without cutting the bladder neck. It's not physically yeah, possible. Yeah. Very, right? very valid point. And I have seen you going uh, a little few millimeter at the bladder neck inside. I, I was observing that. Uh, won't yeah. it uh, give a feeling of less cut? Ideally, that is the way TURP has to be done. I think so. I, I yeah. think so. I think very beautiful. You, you are leaving a little bit of mucosa, which is elastic at the bladder neck and keeping intact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but most of the later, what do you think in homium? Uh, wide, but they almost like trigone, they take out and it looks wide. Is it correct? Yes. Or little bit of the uh, that sphincter type of bladder neck should be intact mucosa. I think se Again, second one is logically. I think so, and yeah. logically, yes. But yes. again, there's no literature. I mean, bladder, neck more... stricture, bladder neck stricture will be less with your technique if you leave the mucosa more. So I've been doing this for eight years. I've had Great. two black neck contractures, two. And both okay. of them were very small glands. They were, uh, you know, 50 and 40 grams. So okay. I learned that when I do small glands, I actually incise the bladder neck for the small prostates because I don't yeah. want them to get a bladder neck contractor. But bladder neck contractor is very low. This is why, again, this is my personal opinion. Felipe is a good friend of mine. I don't want to say anything, but but he does the slim, the slim hole up, right? This 18.5 uh, French. Uh, and his big uh, advantage, he says, is to avoid the bladder neck contractor. But I don't have bladder neck contractors. So I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure that I... I you are using 26 standard size? 
26 or 24, yeah. 26, 26 most of the time. 26 most of the time. So, if you've tried, uh, how about you? Are you guys using 26 as well? 26, 26. And uh, definitely yeah. we find every time little pinch uh, when we are moving the, sometimes with a uh, little friction, we will see the yeah. mucosa little bit of, uh, little bit of uh, damage, no doubt. If the Foley's catheter is kept uh, for 2-3 days or a patient with retention, lot of ease will be there like in stent in RIRS. I, yeah. I really appreciate the yeah. elasticity of the urethra and a little bit of ease in moving the resectoscope when the Foley's is there. Yeah, very true, very true. Um, if you've tried the 24, just that uh, two French difference, the flow is a lot less, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, yeah, yeah. Difficult. So as we, this is just the lateral. Now this is the easy part, right? So this is what I was saying about the lateral uh, to medial. I really try to do. See, I'm already down to uh, what is this? Three o'clock already, right? So I really try to get all the way down as much as possible. Now this is a hundred gram prostate, so not a big deal. But I really try. See how I'm very advanced at the bladder neck. I'm really trying to get all the way down to six o'clock. Really, that that is the key to yeah, yeah. not having difficulties afterwards. I, I think we don't go to the bladder neck initially this much. In the beginning yeah. only, you have made from uh, twelve o'clock to three five in the beginning only. Yeah, yeah. Now you are I going back, the, turning down. Yeah, yeah. yeah as much as we can. Yeah, yeah. As much as I can. Yeah, yeah. It makes it easier, much easier to push the uh, prostate afterwards. Very easy afterwards. I'm almost yeah. down to, uh, you know, five o'clock here. So, five o'clock. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Very, very easy afterwards. This is the fun part in, in my in my head, where I uh, have the residents take over. I'm able to That's see this peel peeling off easily. It's peeling off. Yes. So, uh, other I'm point here. Peeling off. Fantastic. Other point is here. I actually touch the tissue. If you notice now. Now I don't care. I don't. I don't. I know where the planes are. The process is is done. Now I just want to go fast. So here you'll see I touch the tissue a lot more because I'm not worried about anything. So I just go, 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 get it out fast as I can. So um, it's okay. you can do either as long as you feel comfortable. Whatever you feel comfortable with. And see again. No, there's very little bleeding. And this this is a it's a great laser. Really great, great laser. laser. Yeah. So yeah. primarily coagulated too much. What's a, what morselator are you guys using over there? Uh, I'm using starch morselator, coral starch. Uh, how do you like it? Uh, uh, it has uh, actually anteriorly placed uh, blade, slightly confident that the bladder, uh, the if you turn it side, it works well. And very rarely uh, side part of the bladder wall will come so close. I have a feeling that the floor will be sucked uh, if you have a blade at the floor. Whereas this can be tilted side or anteriorly because it is based on the uh, side of the uh, marceloscope. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So the original is the luminous. However, my right? experience is limited. Uh, Pirano from Wool, a lot of people in India use Pirano as well as the uh, Coral Star. No conflicts of interest. Now the yeah. Quanta also has come. Vari various are there. You, sh you should be the most experienced because you are doing uh, Holep also. Yeah, I so I did. Uh, I used Luminous for the beginning of my career. Okay. I then tried the Storts, uh, yeah. and now for the last uh, three years, I've been using the Piranha. Yeah, Piranha. A lot of people say it is very good. It's very good. I have had no problems. I'm really, really impressed with this technology. Um, so, so just quickly, you want to have a full bladder, as you know. I have two inflows, no outflow. Uh, and you just want to, the most important thing is good, is being able to see. If your visualization is good, morselation yeah. is a very easy. So what I like about this uh, morselator is the opening is very small anteriorly, you know, so my residents do this, right? So I, I'm not worried. It's very hard to get the bladder. You have to turn yourself upside down and, and really go for the bladder. But this morselator is very fast, uh, very safe. Um, you can do uh, about 10 grams per minute. So 100 gram prostate is about 10 minutes. Uh, it, there's no beach balls. We used to have this tissue that was too tough for the morselators, but now uh, really no problem. It's a great morselator. I, I highly recommend it. I storts, I thought it was good. I just thought it was slower, uh, was my main concern with the storts. Uh, our experience is limited, so we cannot co comment. Maybe a lot of people suggested Pirana also, uh, but uh, slightly it was more costly 
so yeah. uh, i have taken i am at to use the pirana yeah 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 and then there's another one i have not tried because it's not available uh, i think it's called the hawk morse later in in asia somewhere but i have not used it okay. and quanta quanta from what i understand yeah. is a disposable they are disposable the 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 blade is disposable so uh benefits of the thulium fiber laser for enucleation right so the the main thing i think hands down uh what i can clearly say between holmium and thulium fiber laser is the hemostasis uh, it's been uh, i i find that to be the big big advantage uh, we don't know why we have ideas uh we know that the thulium fiber laser is better absorbed in water it has a lower peak power uh, longer pulse width Uh, also has a shallower depth of penetration so we think all of that makes for better hemostasis you know compared to the homium yag laser has higher peak power it's not absorbed in water as well it has a shorter pulse width so we think all of that makes for the thulium fiber laser to be better for hemostasis but we're not certain but clearly when i do the procedure the hemostasis is better This is just showing the long pulse. So when I use the hemostasis pedal, the one in thirty, this is the long pulse. So you see the little bubbles at the end of my laser fiber, uh, which, which you know, is a bit distracting. But for hemostasis, I think it works well. Okay. Do you think that uh, visible difference is there between? I I, I was not able to appreciate, uh, especially short and long uh, in that enucleation. Do you think that visible difference will be there? I think so. I tried doing it with the long pulse, but you get those bubbles and it becomes distracting I find. Okay. I usually I don't like the bubbles when you're trying to separate the tissue. Um it's not like the the pulse modulation bubble. Uh I I like to use the short pulse. Okay. Versatility, you know, I think I we talked about this, right? This is a laser that is excellent for stones. It's excellent for uh for BPH. uh it's excellent for cutting tissue uh you know if you have some extra tissue you can easily cut it off i do uh you know ureteral stenosis with this uh laser i do upper tract uh, tumors with this uh, laser it's a very versatile laser it cuts extremely extremely well i i love i love this laser for so many things there are some things that i don't like we can talk about as well bladder stones uh you know it's, it's phenomenal for bladder stones have you been doing these i did i i mentioned this on monday uh this is not monday this was a 1.7 cm stone on monday i had a 200 g prostate and i had a 1.5 cm stone uh two 1 cm stones and another almost centimeters so almost 4 cm of bladder stone it took me 7 minutes yeah great 7 minutes it's and minimal trauma to urethra and bladder minimal Yeah, very. And even if you touch the bladder, it doesn't bleed. It doesn't bleed. It just coagulates a little. That's all. And very uh, shallow depth of penetration. So I'm not worried about point one five. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. It works, it works very well. Very well for stones. Previously, if I had lots of stones, I would do the procedure separately. You know, I would do the prostate. I mean, I would do the stones, then I would do the prostate. But now, uh, almost anything I do together, unless yeah. it's really big. but uh, it works very well for stones. Yes. Uh we we talked about this carbonization, right? Uh so there's no clinical impact of the browning of the tissue. Uh, the only thing is it can make you it can distract you from the planes of enucleation as I showed in my video. So you really want to use the no touch technique, stay away from the tissue. I think that helps a lot. Uh makes the procedure much better, much uh, much more uh, uh much more uh, pleasant. Uh so yeah I mean at the end of the procedure you know you know as you know he looks good the sphincter is intact um you know th- these are patients that I'm not sure if you're sending them home the same day but they shouldn't they don't need to stay in the hospital fantastic very nice uh so do we have some time for uh, some yes, advance yes yes please so we talked about this uh so I'm not going to go too much into depth we talked about the end block here I think you know when you're starting off I think a two block technique is good. So this is the original. Huh? Originally it was a three block technique, right? They would do 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock groove, get the median lobe out, then they would do a 12 o'clock, so a three lobe. Uh two lobe I think is good for the big prostates as we talked about or when you're starting off. I think it's nice to orient yourself and sometimes it's too big, you can't push it in. Better to start in my opinion with the two block technique. Uh some people say it's easier the end block. 
Uh, in terms of time saving, you're saving about 10 minutes if you do an end block procedure. Um, so, you know, again, under 150, I usually do end block. Above 150, I'm doing the two block technique. And then here's where, you know, most of the interest lies, I think, in the sphincter adenoma separation. I think uh, there's been a lot of talk about this, um, you know, this, this idea that um, if you don't do the separation early on in the procedure, then during the procedure, you're stretching out that sphincter. And the idea is that if you stretch out the sphincter, that's why you get that early uh, stress incontinence, right? Um, I think what's important to understand with enucleation is if you look at all patients at about a year, six months to a year, the incontinence, the incontinence rate is about 1%, right? So what we're trying to avoid here with this technique is that early sphincter release, early incontinence. So uh, Vera Montanum, that's the uh, lateral lobe, and that's the basically the plane that you want to incise. That's where the mucosal strip is. That's what's attached to the sphincter, which is right here, uh, throughout the procedure. So um, I guess the way I was taught was you go in, the way I showed you, the, the way I showed you my video, you go into the lateral lobe, you do the apical dissection, and you don't incise this, okay? So the way I was taught originally, if you don't incise it, then at the end of the procedure, you have this attachment still to the sphincter, right? Yeah. So you do at the end of the procedure where you bring this uh, mucosal strip down and then you cut it. <laughs> That's really uh, uh, technically yeah. it looks beautiful, but difficult to do. Yes. Oh, I could show you. I don't I must have a video somewhere. I use. I still do it sometimes. Um, but the idea or what the, the hypothesis now is that if you do that, you put a lot of stress on that sphincter, right? The, during the procedure, at the end of the procedure. Um, but as mentioned, we don't know. Don't so know. Uh, what I do now uh, and what you're probably doing is the early sphincter release. There's a number of ways of doing it. Uh, I don't think it's very easy. I think it's advanced technique. So this is the same part. I'm basically lifting up that lateral lobe. The same way I showed you at the uh, my first video here. So yes. just lifting up this uh, lateral lobe. Um, and what we're going to do here, it's called the uh, opening the curtain, they say sometimes. Uh, uh, there's, there's a number of ways of doing it, right? You have, uh, I think it's uh, Dr. Gomez who actually makes a line at the beginning of the procedure, uh, which I don't do. I, I tried to do, but it's, it just seems very difficult to me. So what I do is I lift up the prostate, just like I showed you. Uh, yeah. away from the sphincter. Uh, I take my time. And then once I'm, you know, probably around uh, six o'clock or seven o'clock, as you'll see here, I'll then start incising the mucosa. It's, it's so much fun when you can see so well, eh? Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Actually, this point of uh, keeping a little away, we missed the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so much we are touching and black that becomes brown however fast unless you are very fast it will cause carbonation yeah yeah so here's the mucosa and it's yeah, yeah. attached behind me right so basically i just incise it it's it's not a very difficult procedure but i do feel it is more advanced right you don't want to uh, damage the sphincter you are leaving a uh, lot of mucosa there a little bit yes oh yeah 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 i leave you it are leaving I, one I, centimeter to two centimeters i don't mind yeah yeah even more i'm okay with yeah, because I, 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 that much gland may not be there yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the uh, attaching to the other side there. You can actually see it yeah. right there. Yeah. Nice. So that's, you know, it's 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 something that we do. Uh, does it help? I don't know. I'm not convinced yet. So all you have left is this small little uh, tissue um, right there. But I think what's important is you want to preserve the uh, the anterior attachment that's very important uh, that's where a lot of the uh, uh, continence uh, comes from from you know dr herman's lectures so a lot a lot of uh, well-known urologists are are looking at this uh, subject you know there's the new i don't know if you've heard this from dr herman now he's actually keeping that whole anterior strip connected the whole time yeah <laughs> I mean, I don't know. But you know what, what is interesting is so many people are looking at this. There has to be something, right? You know, you you might have done, let's say, 15 cases or you might have done 2,000 cases 
everybody has the same early incontinence. Huh? So we know everybody's in the same boat. Huh? This we don't we cannot hide this. Even though when I was learning in fellowship, nobody talked about it. No, no, no. Everything's perfect. Everybody's hundred percent continence the first day. Oh, no, no. What you said so is correct. Doesn't... Very, very honest. Yes, yes. Karma I... sir presented in this forum also. Uh, oh yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, he presented, and uh, he he has shown that strip leaving is crazy. That about uh, the long strip leaving. <laughs> uh, so many, like in pyloplasty, they used to show the stenting method. So many, but yeah. here now to prevent continence, so many people have suggested. Uh, so many, uh, but recently, lot of people are accepting this early apical release. Yeah. Lot of lot of people. Yes. yes. But it but is very typical to document and prove that this is the best, as you said from beginning many times. Yeah, yeah. So two two things I'll say. The people yeah. who say they have hundred percent continence, those are the people I have trouble believing. Those are the people that, even though I love them and I and I love to talk to them, when they tell me they have no incontinence, not correct. The second thing I'll say, uh, you mentioned it. I uh, I try to be as honest as possible. I, mm -hmm. You saw I have um, I have um, consultant agreements with different companies, but I try not to let that influence what I say. Yeah, yeah. I try yeah. to be as honest as possible. So again, I think we're almost done here. If you have questions, uh, it's yeah. my pleasure to answer we, them. As, as we will as take uh, questions. A lot of questions are there from me, for the audience, and from Manas. So well, last last slide. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're starting again, very important. Watch lots of videos. Go see someone, one of you who have done the, you know, fifty to hundred cases, uh, and then um, you know, ideally, you, Dr. Mohan, you guys should go to uh, their there to help them if they want to learn. Yeah. That's the best case scenario. Uh, you want to start with a, a larger gland, you know, 70, 80 to hundred grams. You don't want to do too big, but you don't want to do small glands either. Huh? Those small ones are very tricky. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think there's, you know, more and more literature, as we talked about, enucleation is the, the current gold standard, uh, the future. Uh, thulium fiber laser, if you compare to the homium YAG laser, I think hemostasis is one big benefit. Uh, versatility, you can do everything with it. Uh, bladder stones, of course, there is a learning curve. Uh, but I think really, as we've discussed, you know, this is the future of, uh, of BPH surgery. We, uh, we all should be doing enucleation and, and we should be discussing how to make it better, right? This is an evolving field. Uh, just like sphincter adenoma separation. There's many, many things to learn again. So that's what's exciting. Uh, again, thank you so much for the invitation to present here on this forum. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here. Hopefully, one day in the future, I'll come and visit you. Yeah, yeah sure. So with your permission, I'm stopping the sharing so that we can have questions. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so Manas, uh, you also keep ready the questions. It's a quick fire questions because I, I have seen the problems. This is the first presentation on TFL enucleation in our forum. Not many people in the world have done it. Not many people in the world have done it. I am very happy for one reason that a person who has done 8 years with the homium laser is accepting that this is versatile can be used. Based on that I am asking the questions. Yes. Uh, Manas in between you also ask the questions. Uh, let you be because you are also developing a lot of interest in this maybe more knowledge about the mission and he is doing in my other in I have three institutes so in the other institute he is doing in my institute is I'm doing he's more keen to learn and as well as uh, he has already done more than 30 cases so let us have a quick fire questions number one lot of people even in stone lithotripsy are telling different types of laser settings because it has a wide range wide range what things you understood confidently in uh, prostate and stone quickly tell us uh, the for stone you use uh, uh, dusting or fragmentation with what setting it will be very yeah. useful for the audience yeah so so a great question uh, so for for thulium fiber laser and nucleation uh, just quickly again review one in 60 uh, one uh, joule 60 hertz for uh, enucleation with a short pulse, one joule 30 hertz uh, long pulse for hemostasis. That's pretty much it. Um, okay. For stones, very important. Uh, I use the thulium. I think the main benefit is for dusting. Yeah. I actually don't think it's very good for fragmentation. 
Um, so, two, uh, uh, I'll come back to this. But uh, in the kidney, when I'm dusting, I like to use a number of different parameters. You're correct. We don't know. The truth is, again, I like to use 0.1400, 0.1200 with the mid, mid medium pulse. Uh, I think that works very well. Um, when you have uh, stones that are harder and it's harder to uh, do the dusting with these parameters, I will go down to, uh, let's say, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 60. Uh, and that usually works well. Um, I like to use those high uh, energy uh, in the kidney. Now, very importantly, in the ureter, I usually change to the holmium laser because I, in the ureter, I like to fragment and pull out the pieces. I don't like to dust in the ureter. Also, very importantly, in the ureter, you don't want to go above 10 watts, right? We've all heard this. Uh, Dr. Ben Chu says the same thing. They've looked at the energy. 10 watts should be the limit in the ureter because you can cause stenosis, maybe. Again, still not clear. But in the ureter, I try to stay below 10 watts. And to be honest, I usually use the homium laser because I want to fragment and pull out. So one in 10 in the, in the ureter with the homium YAG laser. The other... Yeah. Um, the other uh, situation where I use the uh, homium YAG laser. So if I'm in the kidney, now this is homium YAG standard. I don't have pulse modulation. When I'm in the kidney, if I do a percutaneous nephrolithotomy, PCNL, and let's say I'm in the lower pole and I have stones in the upper pole uh, and I go up, I don't use a thulium fiber laser because it's going to dust. I don't want to dust. I want it to break the stone and for them to fall from the upper pole. So I use the homium YAG laser. So basically, when I want to fragment, I usually use the, th the homium YAG laser. Homium YAG laser. You can use the thulium fiber laser. You can use it. You can use it, but uh, it's tougher. Your choice. I'm tougher. Manas, uh, quickly, what is your laser settings for enucleation? Usually, previously we used to use 1.5 joules and 33 hertz. Sir. But okay. of late, we have changed it to near the apex. Nearly, uh, find the correct way, we are using 1 joule 30 hertz. Once we reach the correct pair after apical release has been done, we are jamming up to 1 joules 60 hertz, 1 joules 40 hertz. So we take. Uh, yeah. I don't remember 1 hertz 60 joules used by me. This is the first time I am listening. From tomorrow onwards, I will try that. I am very happy to learn that point. These are the quick uh, copy paste points which uh, you, you uh, researchers are helping us uh, to learn. Second, second question, uh, when you cut the uh, apical region release on the 6 o'clock position when you are curving up when you are curving up there are two ways there are two ways of doing it uh, yes. release the gland from uh, 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock 1 to 2 centimeters see the groove don't cut the mucosa see yes. the groove see the groove and then mucosa will be little bit hanging and then cuts little bit of mucosa and then go up so that you need yes. not imagine where it ends. You need not imagine where it ends. The other yes. way is in the first go only market, which has risk. You need experience for that. So which one you prefer in apical release? 100% the first one. I've yeah. tried both. Yes. I think marking is difficult, like you mentioned. And not only that, marking is very difficult when the patient has a Foley in place because it's like you said it's dilated it's even hard to find the sphincter sometimes because it's so dilated i think marking is very difficult you will get into trouble especially if you if you focus on that line and it has to be that line i, I think it's difficult that's, that's difficult and especially in large glands the marking yes. is more distal and you will be really afraid what happens uh, absolutely so release 100%. a bit release a bit and then see and then go release see and go and it if yeah. you look at the videos, try to try to remember this. When you look at the videos of these um, experts who, who mark the tissue and do these things, look at the size of the glands. It's always a 60 gram, 70 gram. Yes. They don't do 200 grams. With Large the glands is very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah, I agree with you 100 Sometimes the uh, rejectoscope slips, uh, slips out of the sphincter also when doing that very distantly. Anyway, third question yeah. for both of you. Uh, in, in, in case uh, in case at the apical region in the beginning if you leave a few grams of prostate obviously growing through the prostate and then go to the capsule again and then push 
and then push it out of fear for example a junior is yeah. doing you have a lot of fear so leave thin rim of the prostate like in trp last we leave it like that purposefully you go through the gland cut it because this is a very cut, very good cutting laser then reach the capsule with mechanical force and then go all around leave it that gland later on we can see whatever you wanted to do uh, does it have any sense so, it is, of course so, it is not true enucleation great great question i love this question so um i think that would be the best because you would spare the sphincter and the little tissue you leave who cares it will god, never god has not given prostate to be removed god has given to keep it there but but it is very difficult yeah. very challenging yeah. to cut through prostate tissue and find the plane Maybe. if you can do it fine but it it is difficult and you get into bleeding you're right the thulin fiber laser is great but you cut into prostate tissue it likes to bleed finding the the plane afterwards can be tricky yeah. uh, i have uh, you know you invite me another time i'll i'll show you some difficult videos but um but uh, in theory i think it's great if you can do it great but it's it's tough it is oh, tough okay manas you do agree that this can be done so no not in our experience but some of our friends they are doing at not on bilateral side at least one side they these are the apical tissue one side Side they complete even though they are little bit proximal to the vero also they complete sir they claim that there is a good chance of uh, maintaining incontinence okay that's uh, my 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 yeah good my one side you can try so that you have a feeling inside from heart that you have not damaged complete sphincter not <laughs> <laughs> that's a feel feel good factor uh, so my fourth question. Uh, traditionally for a long time incision of the prostate is done at 12 o'clock because less tissue will be there and start everything after that also you can release apex but now that is going away that is slowly going away because if you go from below up a transverse plane is in tra the transverse plane behind the pubic symphysis is very easy to develop when it is intact the, this yeah. is the this is the leading role for the uh, end block resection Uh, apart from difficulty in large glands in a medium under grams gland you can develop nice plane by pushing after the apical release so do you think that any time you require to cut the mucosa from the bladder neck in the anterior part nowadays i am not seeing that nobody is cutting anteriorly especially yeah. in apical release those those who believe in apical release yeah yeah it's a good question um I used to do it some I, I tried to do it a few times when Dr. Lingeman after I left fellowship was starting to do that uh he was he thought it might help with uh, incontinence um but I I I think you're right very few people are doing it it's also trickier to find the plane I find from above you know sometimes I will do it so if you do the way I taught or the way I do it yeah. you do the lateral side right sometimes the plane is no good so i go to the other side very rarely that side is no good then i will go anterior it's like a backup to the backup plan yes yes okay next uh, question uh when uh, again it's a mistake i was doing after you told i am understanding that if you release the large prostate in the 6 o'clock to 3 o'clock position in the beginning when the laser fiber is at the bottom you always tend to perforate and go more deeper this is my problem yeah. you if yes. you wanted to cut the prostate at the base i mean at the 3 o'clock to 9 o'clock below below you have to turn the scope up and do it do you, do you, do you feel when you follow your technique of coming from above it is never required because always the laser fiber is at the bottom it may not be required so now i got the point so uh, in the last part only you will cut the mucosa otherwise rest of the gland you try to come from above down that's what you mean to say that is yes. a very very important point uh, we take manas I, you agree that yes sir uh, it is very good point yes sir uh, because we used to try a little bit from below little bit from above it is really difficult that is wrong so for the audience it is a very good point to be taken now my next question if the bleeder is there after perforation of the capsule the arterial small bleeders are very easy to coagulate but a opened capsule even in trp we notice that once you put the folies they will stop once you wash it will be coming it's a washing blood 
Yes. So what will you do with the laser in such situations? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I try to avoid perforation. Yeah, that's that's, that's correct. correct. That's correct. Right, you're right. You're right. It is. It is difficult. Uh, I do the best I can. You know, it's really important to try to coagulate as much as you can. Uh, you know, ah. till the end. But you're right. At the end, you put in a Foley catheter, and you know, sometimes if it bleeds too much, you can't even do the morselation. You know, so and that is a problem. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Yeah, you have to try to do your best. Uh, you could even try, you know, switching to terp, uh, you know, in the bipolar or something. But it it becomes difficult. Yeah. Uh, last couple of questions. Uh, after the enucleation of the prostate, uh, usually we, before we take, uh, we usually uh, have the storage uh, uh, resectoscope as well as the laser scope. The we change to uh, uh, the loop and then quickly coagulate the, which, which will give comfort, lot of comfort before we put the marcellator. Somehow uh, with the laser, of course there should not be any bleeding. But I am asking whatever the problems I have faced because I am in still in yeah. the lucky part of this surgery. So if you have bleeding, uh, you, are you comfortable with laser fiber 550 microns and coagulating all the quickly? Are you comfortable? Yeah, so an uh, excellent question. The problem is once the prostate is in the bladder, yeah. it's very difficult to stop the bleeding. Yes, the yes. The prostate yes. is so large. Yes. Fluid. It's very hard to know where it's coming from. So what I recommend, very important, is when you're doing the procedure, stop the bleeders. I am very meticulous when I'm doing the procedure. So as yeah. I go, I stop the bleeding. As I go and my residents, I tell them, you have to stop the bleeding. I go a little bit, I check. I go a little bit, I check. It, it's very okay. quick, right? You get used to it. But I do the hemostasis during the procedure. At the end of the procedure, I will check basically three spots, bladder, neck, always bleeds, anterior, because yeah. you're usually tearing it off, so it bleeds more, and then near the sphincter. Those are the three spots I check before I go to morselation. You cannot do the whole thing with the laser fiber. Laser fiber. It, you, That's frustrating if you are. That means meticulous yeah. hemostasis while doing itself is the recommended point. Yeah. Most that, important. That, that's a very, 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 very good, very, very good answer. And uh, yeah. in case... Uh, uh, what are the tips uh, to avoid sub-trigonal? Uh, anyway, again, your answer uh, from 12 to if we cut the mucosa 12 and then keep on coming, you will be jolly well seeing the bladder also. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That is a very yeah, good exactly. point. So the 90 percent exactly. of the 90 percent of the answer is uh, done there itself. Uh, I'm I'm yeah. really I'm really very happy for that point today. That try to come from 12 whole length as much as possible below three o'clock also then 90 percent yeah. of the job is done yes uh, yes and yeah. this this does occur though dr mohan the, the uh, subtrigonal sometimes the prostate goes there huh? you have no In choice fact, you have to follow but if you go laterally it's much easier much easier much easier manas uh, you have any question please one or two questions yes sir yeah please uh, sir at the end of the procedure after the enucleation when you are checking the fossa and at the splinter, you see most of the time we see that there is a jagged edges over the splintered mucosa. Does that usually affect our uh, splintering effect? Oh, I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't uh, get the question. Sir, at the, at the end of the procedure, when yeah. we are checking the splinter, we see that uh, splintered mucosa is always usually to be eroded, though it is not completely uh, affected, but usually we see that. It, uh, jagged edges over that splintered mucosa. That does yeah. mean that patient will definitely have incontinence in the posture. I don't think so. I, I I think I get. I think I know what you're talking about. Sometimes it looks a little bit eroded on certain areas of the sphincter. Yes. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I don't think that has any impact. It's just the mucosa, right? I really don't think so. I, I think you should be fine. But you try to keep it intact as much as possible. Let's be honest. If you do the top-down method. And you bring that mucosa down and cut it, you know, it's basically completely trashed, but uh, they still have continence. I don't think so. Uh, well, one more point, sir. After the, after the procedure, even the usual, most of the time, people will have the early incontinence. Maybe at least, at least one, till one month. So what, yes. are, what are your uh, protocols? How you advise them? Yes. So, I, I, absolutely. I, you know, first of all, you tell the patient, that's the most important thing. Tell the patient, don't worry. First four to six weeks, don't worry about anything. It's normal. You will lose urine uh, in your underwear. This is normal. 
So the best thing, the best thing I think is to start the exercises, pelvic floor exercises before surgery. Uh, so at least a month to two months before they're starting the pelvic floor exercises, because once you do surgery, they can't do the exercises, you know, for the first couple of weeks because there's bleeding. And if they do exercises, then they'll have more bleeding. So one to two months before surgery, pelvic floor exercises. After surgery, I say, don't worry for the first four to six weeks. And then if there is still some, then it will be uh, exercises. And then make sure he doesn't have hyperactive bladder. Uh, then it will be, you know, anticholinergics. But I don't do, I don't do any medication until six months. Uh, I, have seen, uh, I have seen few patients, those who leak intermittently on the first day of catheter removal. On the first yes. day of catheter removal, they pass urine in the bathroom. But in between, they do very well. Yes. Then continuous incontinence. Yes. If they go to the bathroom by evening and pass around 100 ml, they do very well within one week. Uh, yeah. I mean, those who are continuously leaking, not at all going to the uh, uh, voluntary widening, uh, they, they will be little uh, this, uh, this thing. And it happens in large gland, very large gland. Yes. Uh, yes. Very older. large gland incontinence is more. All, uh, large gland, older patients, more comorbidities. They've been obstructed for a longer time. Their bladder is no good. There's a lot of, lot of factors. I don't think it's only one thing. I think there's many right. factors. So, one more question, sir. Sure. Can I ask? Sir, you, you mentioned about the same day discharge. So, how yes. do you do the 24 hours? Or like the morning you do the surgery and the night you discharge? Or overnight the same the, uh, They leave between four and eight hours after surgery. So, I do surgery. After surgery, they go to the recovery room. They have irrigation. Yeah. Uh, I will go see them about two to three hours later after my next case, basically. Uh, if it's looking good, I'll start. the nurses will start decreasing the irrigation. Patient will start drinking. I will come see them again about two or three hours later. Looks good. I stop the irrigation. They go home with the catheter. The following day, it's removed. Fantastic. Okay. Very, very um, doable. You can, you can do this. It's not hard. Yes. You just hey. have to make sure the nurses are aware and they uh, agree to start lowering the irrigation and the patient starts drinking. Uh, I do 90% of my cases under regional, not asleep, regional. Uh, last question, Manas, with your permission, yeah. because we are crossing one hour. Uh, where, do you, do, where, where can we see your surgeries? Because a uh, lot of juniors will be interested. Uh, are you posting your surgeries in your blog or any anything any way we can learn from you for the audience from India because it's a hugely populated urology solution uh, uh, urology society in India nearly 4,000 urologists uh, and 300 urologists every year they come out so uh, ha do you have any uh, website or anything uh, related to your surgeries technical points See, today we learned two important points such a such important points and uh, keeping laser fiber half centimeter away make it like homium and second point is come from uh, uh, top to bottom in most of the gland separation fantastic highly appreciated very kind thank you um no i don't have a vlog uh, i i should have one i think but uh, youtube you can find it i've done a number of videos with olympus okay. um the the live surgery i did last in november uh, Dr. Babu, I think you were there. That, that's online as well. Yes. So there's a number of videos online that uh, you can find. And then now you have this one. Yeah, this is a, this is going to be viral, hundred <laughs> percent. <laughs> this is going to be viral already. For your information, uh, two hundred audience have watched the program right now live. Two hundred. Thank you. Two hundred urologists. Very kind. Thank it's you. a big number. Thank you very much once again being with us. Uh, uh, in future also, I may ask you maybe yearly once like that. Uh, if any updated technology, sure. maybe on RIRS also a bit, because sure. tulium fiber laser in US, uh, you are the first person I am interviewing. I am very happy in Western country uh, that has come up and uh, you are using it uh, very nice, very nice. And you understood so much in such a short time. Thank and you. Uh, you, you, that's the research actually. That is the um, orientation. Great, Thank sir. You. I will appreciate that. Very kind. Uh, Thank you so uh, much. Manas, Thank, you okay. the, thank you for the invitation again. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much.